Gmar Chatima Tova. May we be sealed for a year of blessing. Start with a story that takes me back a few years. It was ninth grade. Not an easy time to begin with. And I was going to go on the Englewood bus that year to my high school, Ramaz, in Manhattan. Jeremiah Kissel and I will be discussing it later. Englewood, New Jersey was a little bit different. Kids had driveways that could take several minutes to traverse. I lived in Teaneck, and my driveway could pretty much hold two cars, all right, small cars. I was nervous as anything. I got up each step of the bus. The other, the other kids, kids were, were annoyed, annoyed that their, that their trip, trip would, would now, now be longer, longer, that this new kid from the ne next town was on their bus. And so I walked even slower up the stairs. An 11th grader started yelling just as my head popped over the seat back. Amalep! Here comes Amalep! I fought back the tears, although I had no idea what he was talking about. Days later, when it was explained to me that my name appeared on the bus list as Amalep Learner, since for who knows what reason, the bus company had taken my name from my mother's check, which she signed, Ann Lapidus Learner. And they combined the Ann and Lapidus into Amalep. Not a good start. And things went downhill from there. The older boys then decided that my head was so symmetrical that they would tease me, roundy, roundy. Hey, roundy, how's it going? How, hey, roundy, how's your head? And on and on it went. It was pretty ruthless. They shamed me, and I felt ashamed. Our tradition has its own story about shame, which takes place at the time of the destruction of the Second Temple. Explaining this disaster, the rabbis in the Talmud ask, considering that the people during that time were engaged in Torah study, were scrupulous in their observance of the commandments, the mitzvot, and were engaged in deeds of loving kindness. They didn't perform the sinful acts that occurred during the time of the first temple. So why was the second temple destroyed? The Talmud answers, it was destroyed due to the fact that there was wanton hatred during that period. And to flesh out this wanted hatred, this causeless hatred, this sinat chinam, they tell the following story about an anonymous man and two others, Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. This anonymous friend, had a, anonymous man had a friend named Kamsa, and apparently he had an enemy named Bar Kamsa. I think they could come up with more names, but in any case, the man planned a large feast, and he told his servant, go and bring me my friend Kamsa. The servant went and mistakenly brought Bar Kamsa. The host came round the tables and found Bar Kamsa sitting at his feast. He said to Bar Kamsa, you are the enemy of my friend Kamsa. Bar Kamsa's enemy is my enemy. Your Kamsa's enemy is my enemy, therefore you are my enemy. What are you doing here? Get up and leave. Bar Kamsa said to him, since I'm already here, I'll pay for my food and drink. Just, just let me stay. Don't embarrass me by sending me out. The host responded, no, you must leave. 
our comps responded, I'll give you the money for half of the feast. Just, just don't send me away in front of all these people. Host said, no, you must leave. Barcomsa said, I'll give you all the money for this feast. Just let me stay. The host said to him, no, you must leave. And he picked him up by his hand and let him out of the feast. After having been cast out, Barcomsa said to himself, since the sages were sitting there and did not protest the actions of this host, although they saw how badly he humiliated me, learn from this that they were content with what he did. From there, Barcomsa goes to the Roman authorities and informs them about the planned revolt in the Jewish community, which then, of course, leads to the destruction of Jerusalem. So what can we learn from this story? The blame for the destruction of the holiest place in Jerusalem can be traced to the action of shaming someone. Barcampsa begged and begged not to be publicly shamed, ostracized, and disconnected from the rest of the community to no avail. From here we learn about public shaming, but there is also the private, intimate, personal experience of feeling shame. Brene Brown, a professor of social work and a best-selling author, has spent decades studying shame and the power of vulnerability. I found her distinction between shame and guilt to be especially illuminating. As generations of Jewish parents have known, Brown agrees that guilt can be helpful and adaptive. It's holding on to something that we've done or failed to do and holding that up against our own values and then feeling that psychological discomfort. When your mother tells you to come home for yuntif, you can feel it. Guilt is about feeling bad for something we have done or not done. The focus is on our behavior. We regret our actions or inactions, and therefore, hopefully, it motivates us to act differently, to be better in the future. But shame, on the other hand, causes us to feel that there is something fundamentally wrong with us. Brown describes it as, quote, the experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging, something we've experienced, done, or failed to do, makes us unworthy of connection. How many of us right now feel that we are unable to share something we've experienced this past year, that we've done or that we've failed to do? How many of us are keeping important details of our lives hidden. That there are things that we feel that we cannot share even with our closest friends. And because of that, Brown explains, at its core, shame is the fear of disconnection. And once we fear being disconnected from others, we do not allow ourselves to be vulnerable and we close ourselves off from that connection. Brown's research demonstrates that shame is highly correlated with behaviors that ca cause harm to ourselves and to others. And the very behaviors that we turn to in order to mask our feelings of shame and regulate our emotions are usually the very behaviors that cause us to feel even more shame. And it's a vicious circle. Today we gather to enact an ancient ritual together. We rise and declare ashamnu. We are guilty. We have betrayed. We have robbed. We have spoken falsely. Ashamnu, bagadnu, gazalnu, dibarnu dofi. 
We've hurt others. We all bear guilt in different ways. But all of us have done this. And we name them very explicitly. The metaphoric book of misdeeds over the last year is shared. As Rabbi Alan Liu writes, we read the book we don't want to read. I've done this and I've done that, and I acknowledge that it's irreversible. It can never be undone. But I cover it over now. I resolve to begin anew. Known as the vidui, the confessional, or the confession, originally appeared at first in the prayer book of Amram Gaon in 8th century Babylonia. The practice is psychologically brilliant. We do not go into a solitary space. We do not atone alone. The tradition invites us all to stand as one and declare all the sins, some we may have committed and some we may not have. But as a community, we take responsibility for all these behaviors. Under certain conditions, we are all capable of behavior that causes us to feel embarrassment or shame. And today, whatever harmful behaviors we have engaged in, whatever damaging words we have expressed over the course of the past year, whether towards ourself or others, we will not be sent away. In fact, it's just the opposite. We are encouraged to stand as one. Some of us open our fists, symbolically removing our sins, allowing ourselves to let go, and some strike our chests in an act of contrition. The latter is described by Rabbi David Wolpe as a sort of spirit, spiritual defibr defibrillator to get our hearts beating anew. Let's view the vidui as an opportunity to release our feelings of shame around behaviors that we are not proud of. As human beings, we are all vulnerable and we are all deserving of compassion as we take responsibility for our behaviors and cast off our sins, we release our shame and stand together knowing that each one of us, all of us, are welcome, worthy, and created with Selim Elohim in the image of God. That's what I hope for, for our community. Not merely reciting a Shamnu time and time again on this day of Yom Kippur, but going deeper, even finding ways to share our vulnerabilities. This is not easy, nor am I suggesting that we publicly announce our deepest secrets. Instead, tonight, let us commit to trying to create an environment where we can develop our relationships. Let's embrace those who are new to our community. Let's identify those people with whom we would like to become closer. A recent example of relationship deepening occurred a few weeks ago at an outdoor kiddush at a community building session where people shared more deeply with each other one-on-one. -on -one. Those are moments where a conversation can lead to more connection. We all have struggles. We all have pain. We all have tsuris. Some of these struggles cause us to stay away, to remove ourselves from the community, usually when we are most in need of connection. My goal for this year is for Amuna to be a community where we support each other, for Amuna to be a place free of judgment, a place where people are given the benefit of the doubt, for Amuna to be a place that we all turn to in times of need, not turn away from. Tonight, let us declare that we are all worthy of connection. We are all worthy of belonging. And as a community, we should not shame. Instead, we should counter shame. Sometimes we shame others as Bar Kamsa and I experienced. And sometimes we're simply afraid to share 
fearing shame. This means that we're all aware that we are human and all fragile. Many times in our liturgy, we ask for help avoiding what happened to Bar Kamsa. We ask to avoid the pain of busha uchlima, embarrassment and humiliation as the prayer for the new month declares. How do we avoid it? The answer is right here. That's the secret. In this room and in this Zoom, it's us. May we together help us move from shame to vulnerability, deepening relationships that can support us. That's what the world needs, to move away from shame to shalom, from disconnection to deepening. And let us confess together to begin this process tonight and make this the year our, when our Amuna family models this. May we be sealed as individuals in the book of life, mindful of the way our community supports one another and enriches all of our lives. And let us all say, Amen. I invite you to turn ahead in your machzer to page 223. I think of uh, singing Kol Nidre as starting the engine, turning the key. Well, not turning the key anymore, pressing the button as its haunting melody tunes us into the sacred magic of this day. Ya'ala, which we are about to encounter, comes a little bit later, after we fastened our seatbelts and maybe turned on the radio or hooked into our Spotify. Ya'ala is pressing the gas pedal. I'll just have one more fun with this. Or the electric pedal. It narrates the drive over the next 24 hours, this evening, tomorrow morning, tomorrow evening. We get on this highway together. We can see the road laid out before us. We see the bumps, the potholes, and finally the drive up to the bridge that is the new year. It's intense, this day-long journey, but we know that the GPS is working, and as we sing Ya'ale, we feel more confident, feeling our prayers and our hearts soaring above. I invite you to rise as you're able for Ya'ale, and let us all ascend throughout this day. Page 223.